Okay, this is a lecture for my uh, seventh hour class on the 13th of February. Okay, so uh, when we left off then, um, Cleveland had just become president. We had just finished the uh, election of 1892. Is that correct? Is that what we've done? Okay. Well, uh, when Cleveland, have we talked about Cleveland getting married? No. Okay, well, no big deal. Uh, but anyway, uh, Cleveland uh, defeated uh, Benjamin Harrison uh, in 1892. He defeated the populist candidate for president. Who was who was the populist candidate for president last night? Who? Weaver. Weaver. Yes, very good. He defeated Weaver and he became president. And of course, you know, he had been president four years before this, but in 1888, the people turned him out of office, but he was back in 1892. We've done all that, right? And he won this time. And, you know, things seem to be going great for, for Cleveland and the country. Like I say, he's 50 years old when he's elected president uh, the second time. He's a bachelor. He never had married, and he marries this girl. He's 50 and she's 22, okay? Today they have cover girls. Uh, in those days, they didn't have cover girls necessarily, but they had a photographer. His name was Gibson, and he went around and tried to photograph the most beautiful women in America. If you want to know what beauty was considered in 1892, there it is. That young lady's name, and you don't have to write this down, her name was Frances Folsom, and she was considered to be the most beautiful woman in America. I'll just let you look at her. And then I'll let you look at him. You know, how does, how does that happen? You know, well, somebody has said that power is the greatest aphrodisiac. You know, if you've got power or money or both, the women will just come flocking, they say. So they got married, and the country was happy. Their old bachelor president finally found a true love. Uh, and then they started having children, and the country was just happy. You know, there's nothing we, uh, there's the happy couple. Uh, are you laughing at these people? They're dead. They can't defend themselves. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, what are what people are going to think when they look at all of us? But anyway, uh, there they are. Uh, you know, uh, there. There's the sketch of the White House wedding, and there's nothing that the American people like better than a White House wedding. You know, the country goes about half nuts over stuff like that. And then they started having children, and that was their first little child. Little cute little girl named Baby Ruth Cleveland, and the country just fell in love with Baby Ruth. Her pictures were everywhere. And you know, I've told you before in here never underestimate the power of an American entrepreneur or businessman to make a buck because when the country went nuts over little Baby Ruth Cleveland, an American candy maker made that candy bar, which is still around, Baby Ruth. Okay, a lot there's a myth that it was named after Babe Ruth. That's just what it is, it's a myth. It was named after this little girl, and uh, this has survived the Clevelands and uh, everybody, okay? So the next time you're in the store, and you they still sell those, don't they? Next time you're in the store and you buy a baby Ruth, I want you to think of Grover Cleveland. Anyway, so everything seemed okay. The country's upbeat and happy, but get this down. In 1893, I mean, he hasn't been president for six months. And in 1893, a panic hit. And what was a panic what do we mean by an economic panic? It's a downturn. downturn. Banks collapse. Businesses collapse. People lose their job. What's that called? A depression. A depression. Excellent. A depression. Yeah. Get this down. A depression hit. And it was pretty severe. Unemployment was in excess of 10% for nearly five years. Yes. You said 1983 or 18? No, I, I, 1893. This is the 18. Yeah, this is this is this is the panic of 93. Everybody got that? Yeah. 1893. I might have said 1983, but if I did, I was wrong. Anyway, businesses and banks collapsed. By the way, was there government help? If you lose their job today, is there you you your parents lose their job today? Is there government help? Yeah. What's it called? Unemployment. Did such a thing exist? No. Why not? Rugged. What? Rugged. This is the age of rugged individualism. You're on your own. If you're hungry, you're just going to have to be hungry and work harder because it's your fault. You know, like you could control this great worldwide economic depression. Like you could control the COVID virus. You know, you have the power to do that. That was, that was their attitude, rugged individualism. 
So helping the hungry and the homeless, it get this down. It was left up to local charities like churches. You know, if you could find yourself a tin can somewhere and a couple of times a day go to the local church, they had a big cauldron of soup, not very good boiling there, but you could get something to eat. People started calling those things Cleveland cafes, okay? Because they blame Keith Cleveland for starting the depression. And let me tell you this, presidents don't start depressions. And by the way, presidents don't end depressions. The longer I teach, the more amazed I am, and I've been doing this a couple of years, the more amazed I am how people give all these powers to the president. They just say, I, I think they believe we don't elect a president, we elect a wizard with a wand. And he can just go up there and go, poof, you know, let there be uh, <clears throat> a strong economy. Poof, let there be world peace. That's not the way it works. In fact, if you ever get around to reading the four pages that are the rule book of this country, read articles, start with article two, just start with, a, it's the president. It's about that long. He doesn't have much power. Just read it and see. Anyway, anyhow, that's a topic for another day. Well, get this down. Um, <clears throat> unemployed people, get this, unemployed people started forming armies. Thousands of them come together. And they're going to march. You with me? They're going to march to their state capitals. And they're going to say to the government, you got to help. We've done all we could. We've worked hard. We've saved our money. And now this depression that we have no control over came and took it away. You've got to help us. And the most famous of them, and by the way, these are called tramp armies, okay? Tramp, it's an old-fashioned word for hobo. You know what a hobo is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, tramp, hobo. And uh, these are tramp armies. And the most famous tramp army, get this down, was led by this man, Jacob Coxey. Okay, Jacob Coxey. And Jacob Coxey wasn't poor and he wasn't broke and he wasn't hungry. He was a businessman that lived in Ohio and he was doing pretty good. He was worth about $250,000. That would be a few million dollars today. But he had great sympathy for his neighbors who were poor and hungry. So he said, I'm going to lead this army of people all the way to Washington, D.C. We're going to go to Washington and we're going to tell the government they've got to help us. So he collected about 600 people in Ohio. You know what a map of the United States looks like. They're going to go all the way to Washington, across the Appalachian Mountains. He's in a buggy. He just had been married recently. He and his wife, just his wife had just given birth to a little baby boy. What do you reckon they named that little boy? Does anybody here have a dollar? Anybody here? Do you have a dollar? I got a dollar. <laughs> While you're thinking about it, what did they name that little boy? They have a dollar. I'll look at the money. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, just give me that 10. Okay. Just give me that 10. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, anyway. <laughs> I will snap the feet. Maybe I'll show that. <laughs> See that? Can you read that? Yeah. Speak loud. This note is, wow. this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. You know what? You know why you can take that piece of paper today over to the thing from the gas station, whatever it is down there, and you can get gas and if i went down there i'm not gonna pay too much <laughs> but if i if i went down watch there and i watch me yeah but I'm, i might cut for the door at any time <laughs> 10 bucks i can go to the sonic oh boy <laughs> but if i took this you know and i got gas and i went into the one they said you know and i say well here take that there's some lovely notes about jacob coxie and the populist movement uh you just take that what makes this paper this is paper what makes this paper worth so much that you can buy something with it. And this plant, this is paper, but you can't buy anything with it. And the fact is, is that it has that little sentence on it, that little sentence on it, that uh, this note is legal tender. In other words, you can buy this piece of paper right here, unlike that piece of paper, is backed by the gold supply of the United States of America. And guess what? You can buy stuff with it. Now, the reason I went that long explanation it's not really anything important except to tell you what your money's like. But you, what did they name that little boy? They named him Tramp. 
Tramp. Tramp. Little tramp. Little bug. Little hobo. <laughs> they named him. They named him Legal Tender Coxie. Uh huh. You think he got beaten up in middle school? Legal. <laughs> hey, really? He was a brilliant little kid, though. I mean, he was harassed. Legal Tender Coxie. He was harassed, but when he was fourteen, he got a scholar. Went to Princeton when he was fourteen years old. Did very very well. Graduated. By the time he was 18, and he came home with that Princeton degree at Thanksgiving, for Thanksgiving break, and the Coxies were all sitting down to eat dinner, and he ate this big dinner, and he thanked his mom and dad for all they had done for him, except for that name, Legal Tender Coxie. And then he went in the other room, and there was a big, gigantic fireplace. And, you know, in those days, they had little axes. that they should, And he took that axe and came back in that room and chopped them all up. What? Huh? <laughs> No, him. that didn't happen. Oh, but anyway. Oh my God. <laughs> sweet. I think you have sort of a right to, you know, calling somebody legal tender cocky. Anyway, I've spent too much time with that. Listen, 600 of them. We got that 600, not 100, 600 of them start marching toward Washington, D.C. You know, and, and get this down. Cox, he said, I know how to end this depression. Get this. He said, we're not just going to go to Washington to protest. He said, I've got a plan. You know, it's always good to have a plan. And, and, you know, if I ask you on the quiz tomorrow, you see it on the test on Friday, the Good Roads Program, always associate it. Put it in quotes, the Good Roads Program, always associate that with Jacob Coxie. Because here's what he said. Get this down. He said, if you want to end this depression, the government should print paper money. Just print all sorts of paper money. And then hire, get this down, all the people without jobs, all the unemployed, hire them to build roads. We don't have a national highway system. We need a national highway system. So print up this money, by the way, and, and he said, and pay them $1.50 a day. Now, is that paper money going to be worth much? No. no. But is it worth something? Yes. 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 You know, if you haven't eaten in two days and somebody comes by and says, well, you know, here's a dollar and 50 cents. Are you going to say, well, gee, I can't buy anything with that. Just keep it. Mm -hmm. No, you're going to take that dollar and 50 cents and say, I'll buy something with it to keep from starving. So that's his plan. Road building. So they march all the way to Washington. He's in his buggy with his wife and little legal tender. I think little legal tender is about six months old. And they go all the way to Washington. And when he got there, what he wanted to do was get up on the steps of the Capitol and make a speech. Of course, the whole country's following this journey in the newspapers, and uh, they look, you know, the, the government knows they're coming, and the government thinks this is, this, you know, for years people have been threatening, the working class has been threatening a revolution. This is it. And so they have the army out there, they have the police on high alert, and the police, you know, the Capitol Police, you know, the same guys from January 20th, the Capitol Police are told, you watch him. You watch everything he does when he gets here to the Capitol. And the first time he even acts like he's trying to break the law, you arrest him. So the police are on high alert. They're ready. These 600 people show up. Coxie pulls up in his buggy, gets out. There was a sidewalk like this. You walk on the sidewalk, and then you turn. You walk up to the Capitol steps, and you can turn around and make your speech. But Coxie, I guess, after finally arriving in Washington, was in a hurry, and instead of following the sidewalk, he cut across the grass, and there was a sign that said, don't walk on the grass, or keep off the grass. And for that little infraction, the police arrested him on the spot. Took him to jail, got this down, he's arrested. They take him to jail. Let's see. They find him $5 and kept him in jail for 20 days. And they told the rest of his followers, unless you want to go to jail for 20 days, get out of here. And they all went back to Ohio. And it failed. But listen, get this down. This got the attention, get this down. This got, got the attention of the national government. Again, something has to change. Capitalism is only working for a few. It has to be reformed. And if not, the next time we come back, we may come back with guns. You may have a full-fledged revolution in America. Well, to make matters worse, I mean, you know, the economy's going to hell. To make matters worse, Cleveland, who was an avid cigar smoker, 
You know, uh, one night was sitting in his study and I guess he was running his tongue over the roof of his mouth and he felt a rough patch. And he called his doctor in the next morning and the doctor pried open his big mouth and looked at it and said, yes, sir, Mr. President, that's cancer. And it's in an advanced stage. Uh, but we've got to take it out. If, and to do that, we're going to have to slit your lip open and peel it back. And then we're going to have to start cutting right here between your two teeth. You know, you can take your tongue right now, feel the roof of your mouth. That's your palate, right? If that wasn't there and you had an extraordinarily long tongue, you could tickle the bottom of your brain. Uh, but we're going to have to cut that, just go right along the curve of the roof of your mouth and cut half that out and then fry it out, take your jaw, teeth, and everything. And then replace that with a rubber... A replica of your jaw, a fake jaw, okay? And so Cleveland said, well, you know, we've got to do it. I know it'll kill you. But he said, we've got to do this in secret. We can't let the American people know what's going on. You know why? Because the economy's already bad enough. For all of you people, all of you future stockholders, let me tell you something, all sorts of, I've never owned stocks, it's a good thing. Uh, but uh, all sorts of things affect the stock market. A few years ago, we had a tsunami that hit Southeast Asia, killed 300,000 people in an afternoon. That's halfway across the world from us. The New York Stock Exchange, people lost millions. On the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated on Friday, November 22nd, 18, uh, 19, I keep getting to 1963, the, 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 the stock market suffered greater losses than it did in October of 1929 when the Depression began. It's called the crash of 1929. John Kennedy's assassination caused great, all sorts of things. A war can break out. You know, your stocks can be doing just fine. And then you uh, go online to see how your stocks are doing or your stockbroker calls you and you've lost thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Cleveland said this, the economy's already in terrible shape. <laughs> if the people find out that the president has cancer, uh, it might cause uh, even a worse economy. So they said, we better come up with a plan. So here's what they plan to do. All presidents have a yacht. I think since Franklin Roosevelt, they've all used the same yacht. It's in the Potomac River. It's called the Sequoia. I think that's true. I'm quite certain it's true. And the president will have guests over. And they'll go out on the Potomac and float up about, you know, have dinner and all kinds of stuff. But uh, what, whatever his yacht was called, they said, bring the presidential yacht up to D.C. and I'm going to sneak on board at night. And then the next day, we're going to announce that the president's going fishing. So that's what we did. He went on the yacht, said the president's going fishing. They leave, Virginia. they leave Maryland and Virginia, and they go all the way up to New York, and they're in the harbor of New York, and people in New York City can see, oh, there's the president's yacht. You know, he's out there fishing. He wasn't. They lay him on a, an operating table, and they took cocaine, and they rubbed the roof of his mouth and the whole top of his head went numb from that cocaine. And then they split his lip and pull it back. Okay. Put put your finger right there on your that, that, where your finger it's like where your finger is ends up over here. That'd be good. That's just the start of it. And then they cut that out and they pry that out of his mouth. The roof of his mouth. You know, half of his roof, half of his mouth is just there's a hole there. You can stick your fingers up in the, through the roof. And then they put this. Uh, artificial jawbone with teeth in it, and when they put it in, it didn't fit. So they had to pull it back out and work on it, you know, and they finally put it back in. And the president comes around. I don't know, you know, with cocaine, I don't know if he was completely out or not, but uh, they, when, when the president finally regains consciousness or whatever, uh, he couldn't talk. He couldn't say a word. So we had a president that couldn't talk. But in those days, presidents could get around away with a lot more. There was no television, there was no radio, there was no Facebook, there was no Snapchat. You know, the president can't sneeze today without us all knowing it. And I don't think that's a good thing. But he could get away with that. And over the weeks and days that followed, they pretty well kept him secluded. And he began to talk again, but uh, for the rest of his life, and he lives in pretty good old age, for the rest of his life, he couldn't uh, pronounce certain words, okay? But we didn't have television. We didn't expect to hear the president on the radio, you know, uh, so so he could get so he could get away with that, Grover Cleveland. Well, that'll take us, get this down, to the election of 1896, all right? 
Now we're going to the election of 1896. And by 1896, Grover Cleveland was the most hated man in America. <coughs> Pardon me. By 1896, Grover Cleveland is the most hated man in America. Why is he so hated? Midler, the, depression. the Depression. Very good. Write that down. The Depression. And it wasn't his fault. But he was so unpopular. Think about this. His own party said, we're not going to nominate him. It'll be a death kiss. We'll lose. Kind of like Joe Biden. You know, right now, close to half his party doesn't want him to run again in 2024. That's bad news if you're a president. Your own party, it's one thing for the Republicans to say, but your own party don't, doesn't want you. So Cleveland is the most hated man in America. What are the two issues in this campaign? You know, every every campaign comes down to a couple of issues, usually one issue. But what are the two issues in this campaign? The money. What about it? Uh, if they're going to go pay for it or not. Uh, well, if they're going to go uh, what or not. Huh? Sorry, uh, change monetary To what? The and so Silver or gold. gold? Write that down. The money. Somebody said the money question. Very good. Excellent. Silver or gold? What's the other great issue? What's going on in America? The, the, who can get us out of this depression? Who can give me a job? And so that those were the great issues. Well, meanwhile, get this down. Get all this down. Here we are in 1896 now. Meanwhile. The populist, you got to just kind of keep this timeline going. We're in, we are in 1896. The populist had nominated Weaver back in 1892, and they had lost. And so by 1896, get this, by 1896, the populists were looking for a home. In other words, the party may be gone, and it was. But the populists weren't gone, and nor were their ideas. Uh, and I think we did this the other day. Which party did the populists? Democrats. Democrat. Write that down. By 1896, the populists, the populist, excuse me, had fused, fused with the Democrat Party. Get all this down. The Democrat Party is a fusion party by 1896. And the populists were liberal. Okay, so you have liberal populist Democrats and you have conservative, by the way, the liberal populist Democrats, just add this right here, they're for silver, and you have conservative Democrats and they are for gold. And the party, get all this down, the party is divided. Going into this election of 1896, the party is divided. By the way, who's the leader of the conservative gold Democrats? How many Democrats from 1896 do you know? Is it the one that ran in the other election? Huh? Is it the one that ran in the other election? Um, the one that ran in the other election was uh, the Republican. Oh. Uh, yeah. Who's the leader in 1896 of these conservative gold bug Democrats? Can you name me one Democrat from 1896, huh? Lord, That's exactly right, right? The president. The, you with me? The president that his own party doesn't want. But he, you with me? But he's the leader of these gold bug Democrats. And the leader of the liberal populist Democrats was a populist Democrat, write him down, named Williams. Well, no, she's not Williams. William Jennings Bryan. This man right here. And get used to William Jennings Bryan because he's going to be around for a long time. Three times the Democrats are going to nominate him for president. Three times. And three times he's going to get beaten. He's never president. But he's an important figure in American political history, William Jennings, and he's going to be around for a long, long time. This is his first step out on the national stage, okay? So he's there. William Jennings Bryan is there. 
leading these liberal Democrats and uh, Cleveland is here leading the conservative Democrats. That year, the Democrat, get this down, the Democrat National Convention, you know, every four years, both parties have a national convention. In the summer of 2024, the Republicans will have their national convention. That's where Republicans from all 50 states come together in one hall, and the Democrats will do the same. And they do, and the convention lasts for about a week. <clears throat> and they do a lot of things. But one thing they do is by the end of that week, they nominate their candidate for president. And get used to that word, nominate, okay? They nominate their candidate for president. That's the main point of having a national convention. To nominate your presidential and vice presidential candidate. And that year, the Democrats met in Chicago. Chicago. So here are these two groups, conservative Democrats versus liberal Democrats, meet in this big hall that held 15,000 people. And they fought all week. Get it down. They fought all week over silver or gold. What are we Democrats going to stand for? Are we going to be for gold or are we going to be for silver? And, of course, the Republicans are watching this from afar. And what are the Republicans thinking about this? They just want gold. Huh? They think it's funny. They all want They think it's funny. You can stop right there. You know, the Republicans are for gold. You know, they're not even arguing about it. But they think because this party is doing what? Arguing. Huh? Fighting each other. Separate. They're tearing each other apart. The Republicans are going, hallelujah. This is a gift from God. These Democrats are divided. We're going to win. We were going to win anyway because the Democrats are getting blamed for this depression, but we're really going to win now. So they watched them tear themselves apart for a week. And the last speaker, get this down. Here they've had this debate going on all week long. And the last speaker to close the debate, just before they nominate someone for president, the last speaker, you need to get some of this down, the last speaker is him, William Jennings Bryan, this populist liberal Democrat. And he steps up there on the stage, and he was a big, tall man, and he had a booming voice, okay? <laughs> and by the way, they are going to hear him all over that auditorium. Just think about this, 15,000 people. You ever been in a room with 15,000 people? I never have. Where, where were you? I was at Oklahoma City versus Golden State. Or it was okay, so versus Golden State. <laughs> well, I've been in a stadium with 100,000 people, but I've just never been in a room oh, with room. But, but anyway, yeah, they're in a room, okay? It's called the wigwam. That's what they call it. Uh, but anyway, uh, 15, and they didn't have any artificial voice devices, no microphone. And when he speaks, they're going to, he's got a big booming voice, but I don't care how big your voice is, with no microphone. So a, but he's going to be heard in every corner of that room. And the reason for that is not because of his big booming voice, acoustics. In those days before they had, uh, microphones and that sort of thing. Engineers design buildings so it could carry your voice. You know, I I take students over to Pompeii in uh, Italy, and they've got a this one. This is outside. It's an outdoor theater, ancient Gr uh, Roman theater, not Greek. And the seats are like this, and there's a stage down here, and they say it could hold it could hold twenty thousand people. And it's just out in the open, sitting right by the sea. And there are people, you know, running all over that. It's a beautiful thing, but it ruins 2,000 years old, and people are running all over that. And you look at that and say, well, how could the 20,000 people, how could the people sit, sitting about from halfway up here? It was because of acoustics, the way they built the thing. And so what I tell our students to do is I tell them, I say, go up there at the top, just stand there, and so they go trudge it up. And it's quite a walk. And they're up there on the very top, and I'm down here, and there are children running and tourists taking pictures and people laughing and shouting. And, and I will just, you know, just get them up there, and I'll just turn around, and I'll put my hand like this in front of my mouth, and I'll talk just about like this. I'll say, everybody from Uvala, Oklahoma, 
raise your left hand. And I turn around and they're all, they heard every word I said. Acoustics, that's just amazing. You know, when I was in college, the professor would, in those big auditoriums where you've got two or 300 people in the class, the professor would have a little microphone clipped to his tie and he, would, he or she would walk back and forth and the whole time he was talking, you could hear it rubbing against his shirt going, he had all that background noise. You don't do that anymore. We're going back to building buildings like they did 2,000 years, auditoriums anyway, like they did 2,000 years ago. Acoustics. And now that professor can stand down there just like that. I mean, those lecture halls go up. You know, people start seeing it, seeing it over here all the way to over here. But he can stand down there and he can just walk back and forth and he can talk about like I'm talking right now. And they can hear him better than if he got a microphone. It's all an engineering design, okay? Well, that's the way that room was that night. And Brian is going to get up. He's giving the, the last uh, speech of this debate. Get this down. And the name of his speech, get this, that he gave that night, is called The Cross of Gold Speech. The Cross of Gold. Always associate William Jennings Bryan with the Cross of Gold Speech. Some historians say it was, he's given this in 1896. Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address in 1863. Some historians say this was the greatest speech given since the Gettysburg Address. Uh, and he began to speak. And by the time, get this word down, this may be a new word for you, a peroration. By the time he reached the peroration, that's the climax, that's the end of the speech, that's the high point of the speech, whatever you want to call it. You could barely hear people breathing. People were standing silent. They started out sitting down listening to him. And one by one, they'd all, they were so swept away by his oratory, his speaking ability, that they all stood up. People were standing with their hands cupped. And there wasn't a sound in 15,000. They were standing with their hands over the, cupped over their ears so they wouldn't miss one word. <coughs> and this is the peroration. Get this. Don't, you have to write that down. And I want you to read it silently as I read it aloud. Pay attention to what I'm doing here. Brian comes to, at the end of his speech, so this is the climax. He said to those conservative gold Democrats, that's who he's talking to. And by the way, Grover Cleveland is sitting like right over there where you guys are. There's a special presidential box, and he's got all these conservative Democrats sitting there with him. And Brian uh, is standing there speaking to 15,000 people. And he said, to, this is how he ended his speech. He said, you come to us and tell us that the great cities of America are in favor of the gold standard. Burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But if you destroy our farms, grass will grow in the streets of every city in this country. Having behind us the workers of this nation and the world, the producers of wealth, remember them? Having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by workers everywhere, we will answer your demand for a gold standard by saying to you, and at that moment he turned and pointed toward Cleveland, and the whole place, was, oh, they couldn't believe it. He pointed, and he says, we will answer your demand for a gold standard by saying, you shall not press down upon the brow of the working class this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold, end quote. Uh, he said, you're not going to grind under the working class by demanding a gold standard. I want you to write this. You see this highlighted part here. I want you to write that down. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. And, and as he was ending the speech, he did it like this. Just a second. Watch this, and then you can, you can finish that. I'm going to leave it up there. But he said... You shall not crucify, as he's saying that, he's lowering his head down like this against his chest and he's spreading his arms out. He said, you shall not crucify mankind on the cross of gold. And there's just dead silence. And of course, people looking up at that, what did that remind them of? Jesus. Jesus on the cross. And for 60 seconds, nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, that convention hall just exploded. Yep, this, and it just exploded. 
I mean, people threw their hats in the air. They threw chairs in the air. Some stood and just wept, just wept. They, they were just literally swept away by that speech. And who does the convention nominate for president? Bryan. William Jennings Bryan. Write that down. That speech got him a presidential nomination. I don't know if that's ever happened again in American politics. William Jennings Bryan and the cross of gold. William Jennings Bryan and the cross of gold. When you get that written down, everybody get up and take a break real quick. Excuse me. By the way, he was only 36. What is the constant? How old do you have to be to be president? 35. He beat it by one year. I think he's the youngest man ever nominated for president. Never wins it. Can you see? When you get that down, up and get take a break, and then we're going to go on. Well, okay. So the Democrats nominate Brian. Well, with the Depression and the Democrat Party divided like it was, the Republicans said, we can't lose. Uh, and so here's what the Republicans, get this down, here's what they offered to the American people. You know what the Democrats want? They want silver. We offer the American people two things. Get this down. Number one, gold. We're going to stay on the gold. Why make our money cheaper? How will that help America? They said. So we're going to stick with the gold standard. And number two, high tariffs. We're going to keep what out of this country? Foreign goods. Foreign goods so that people will do what? Buy American. Yeah. And if they buy American, America will be stronger and richer. That's it. And they nominate this man for president. They nominate this man for president. Write him down, William McKinley. They put an R by his name, William McKinley. William McKinley, he's an older man. Brian, you know, what a contrast. He's one of the oldest men ever at that time. <laughs> ever nominated. We're breaking records in that today. But uh, he's one of the oldest men ever nominated for president. <coughs> and Brian was, one of, was the youngest. I think Brian still holds that record today, maybe. But McKinley was the last Civil War veteran to be elected president. He was the last Civil War veteran to be elected president. And the Republicans, their slogan in this campaign, get this down, the Republicans wrote, came up with this, McKinley and the full dinner pail. What's a pail? It's a little bucket. Get this out. And by the way, you know, you spell it P-A-I-L, not P-A-L-E. P-A-L-E is, boy, you're looking pale today. McKinley and the full dinner pail. You know a pail from, like I say, playing in the sandbox. But in those days, in 1896, if you had a job, when you went to work, you carried your lunch in a little pail. You put your sandwich in there, and then you put a cloth over it, you'd carry it to work, put it on the shelf, and then when it's time to eat, you would eat. So what are the Republicans saying here? Elect McKinley and what? What? You'll have a full meal. You'll have a what? You'll need a full meal. meal. You'll need your dinner pail because what's McKinley going to do? Huh? He's going to get you money. What? He's going to get you money. No, how? What's it? He's not going to get you What? Work. He's going to get you a job because he's going to end what? The depression. the depression. That's what that means. Elect McKinney, McKinley, excuse me, and you'll need your dinner. You'll need your lunch box again because you're going to have a job. You're going to have a job. Okay. So anyway, uh, we'll finish the election of 1896 when we come back. Quiz tomorrow. Study tonight.
Yes. Brian was a Democrat, right? Brian was a populist liberal Democrat.